The Cinemania Society presents Bake Day by Patrick Ireland. Read for you by Andy Slack. Dedia woke with a faint smile on his chops. He lay warm beneath the blankets, half-formed thoughts floating cloud-like about the edges of his evaporating dream state. Gradually, the waking world came into focus. He would be baking cookies today, a most pleasant prospect. His stash had diminished to the point that only two cookies remained this morning, but by this afternoon there would be a fresh batch of eight dozen, or thereabouts. From bake to bake, the number varied by a few to one side or the other of ninety-six. He had so perfected his formula and procedure that the results were as uniform as if he were operating a bakery shop. This sort of thing appealed to Dedea for no reason he could think of. It just gave him a sense of satisfaction. As always, he proceeded through his morning routine, regular as clockwork, as the saying goes in places where people say such things. Once he had fed and walked the dingo, he scrubbed down the kitchen counters and assembled the ingredients. He plopped the pre-measured one-cup container of can of butter into the KitchenAid mixer bowl and, using a wooden spoon, tested it for firmness. Being made of coconut oil, it was somewhat stiffer than butter would have been, so he left it to soften for half an hour or so. In the meantime, he turned towards the cookie jar at the end of the counter and lifted the lid. As he did so, he heard a strange, gargling voice speak from alongside the refrigerator. It sounded like this. The rising tone at the end of the string of syllables suggested it was a question, though Dead Ear had no idea what was being asked. He turned in the direction of the voice and was surprised by the sight of a four-foot-tall person standing in his kitchen, looking back at him from behind what appeared to be a pair of dark, almond-shaped goggles. The hairless head was larger than normal for a person of that stature, and without feature other than those huge goggles and a lipless mouth beneath a vertical pair of slits where a nose should have been. Ah, remarked Dedier, a space alien in my kitchen. His self-possession was utterly regal. Ah, echoed the space alien in a voice two octaves higher. A space alien in my kitchen. Its eyes blinked twice sideways. So they weren't goggles after all, but actual eyes. Dead Ear could now see that their surfaces comprised hundreds of tiny iridescent facets, like those of an insect. In fact, there seemed to be much of insectness about the creature. It had spindly limbs with too many joints in each, and spiky protuberances jutting out at intervals. It reminded Dead Ear of a praying mantis in many ways, including the pale green coloration of its carapace. Dead Ear's hands continued what they had been about, which was opening the cookie jar and removing the last two cookies. Popping one into his mouth, he politely offered the other to his visitor. As it regarded the proffered treat, the creature's eyes again blinked twice. After a moment's pause, it extended a chitinous appendage and gripped the cookie in a three-pronged claw. Dead Ear released it and the alien inserted it in his mouth. With a discreet crunch, the cookie vanished. Dedea smiled. He felt they'd gotten off to a good start in interplanetary relations. "'Where are you from, friend?' inquired Dedea. "'Where are you from, friend?' was the reply. The vocal replication was perfect, though two octaves higher than Dedea's voice. Dedea took a moment to regard the creature. He felt fairly confident that he was dealing with an hallucination. It would not have been the first time. An advanced psychonaut with decades of ethereal experience, Dedia had often found himself in the presence of extraordinary creatures, many of them far less prepossessing than this one. As such, it had failed to cause any alarm within him. Surprise, yes. Alarm, no. Besides, if it was not a figment of his imagination, it seemed harmless enough. It had taken the cookie without the slightest hesitation, and that had to be a good sign. But Dedia would not be distracted from his plans. Daylight was burning, and there were cookies to be baked. He continued assembling the ingredients and implements relative to the task. He poked the butter again, just about ready. Watch and learn, he admonished his new friend. Watch and learn, came the reply. Dedia added three quarter cups of granulated sugar to the mixing bowl, then an identical amount of light brown sugar, burying the now fragrant can of butter. 
He lowered the power head over the bowl and locked it in place, then turned on the mixer at its lowest speed. When the whirring noise of the motor started, the alien began stridulating along with it, matching its pitch to perfection. As the mixer gradually turned the ingredients into a creamy, smooth paste, Dedia increased its speed bit by bit. The insectoid creature matched the mixer's sound flawlessly. Dedia noticed that the alien never paused for an inhaled breath, but just kept up its keening whine as continuously as did the mixer. When he shut off the mixer, there was silence in the kitchen. "'Well, hell!' he exclaimed. "'I plum forgot the tunes!' Unsurprisingly, his ejaculation was echoed by the alien, word for word. "'Alexa!' he shouted at the service device on the counter. "'Play the album Fly Like an Eagle by the Steve Miller Band!' Fly like an eagle. There followed a confusion of voices as Alexa repeated the command, overrun by the alien's voice saying the same thing. Next, synthesizer chords floated through the room, and the alien's face changed in a strange way. If something already as strange as the alien's face could be said to behave strangely. Its eyes blinked rapidly, and its body began sinuously squirming with the rhythm of the music. Dedia watched in fascination for a few moments, then continued on his cookie quest. He cracked a pair of eggs into the mixing bowl and restarted the motor on low. As the ingredients blended, he added one tablespoon of almond extract and another of Chinese five spice. With the alien watching his every move, Dedia went on to add a teaspoon of table salt and another of baking soda. Moments later, he added a tablespoon of hot water, explaining, I made this can of butter with coconut oil. Since the coconut oil has no water in it, the cookies won't expand unless you add a little water. This time, rather than repeating his words, the alien astonished his host by asking, Why do you want the cookies to expand? It took Dedir a moment to recover from his shock. He stood still, just staring at the creature's insectoid features. Finally, he spoke. You can talk. I can talk, it said. Its voice was high-pitched and tended towards a chittering cadence as it went on. My translator needed to assimilate a certain minimum of your language before it could begin assisting me in communication. We should be good from here on. Dedia was beginning to feel the effects of the cookie he'd eaten. A kind of inner glow of comfort as the music flowed and interwove with his psyche. The alien creature before him seemed perfectly natural and attuned to the proceedings, as if present only for the purpose of learning how to bake magical cookies. Its eyes somehow appeared different than before. Dedia couldn't say just how, but surely they seemed contemplative and unfocused, if that were possible to detect. An idea occurred to him. Klaatuhu barada nikto, he proposed, and waited for a response. The alien regarded this without evident comprehension. Dedia suddenly felt like a fool. He didn't know what the words meant, he just remembered them from some ancient science fiction movie. He hastily changed the subject. You got a name, partner? Came the reply, a combination of sounds irreproducible in print. Dedia couldn't make those sounds. How about if I just call you Herb? It's a nice enough name, and besides, I'm kind of fond of the word myself. You can call me Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, you may call me Herb. The next step in the cookie-making process is the messiest. Adding the two and a half cups of flour as the mixer is working always kicks flour onto the counter. The only way to prevent this is to fold the flour in by hand using a rubber spatula. I don't always have the patience for that, but today I do. Daddy began to do as he had said, folding the flour carefully into the semi-liquid ingredients until everything was moist enough to stick together. Then he activated the mixer again and beat the living hell out of the now-complete cookie dough. At last, he turned off the mixer and unseated the bowl from the stand. Next, he tore a sheet of cling film off a roll and laid it on the counter. He flopped the mixing bowl upside down onto this and banged it with the flat of one hand. The blob of dough fell onto the cling film, and Dedia quickly shaped it into a thick square about eight inches on a side. Folding the edges of the film over his molded slug of dough, he wrapped it tightly and placed it in the refrigerator. Herb took all this in without comment. The music came to an end. 
Immediately, Dedir directed Alexa to play music by Ravi Shankar. As the liquid notes of the sitar oozed out of the speaker, Erba began swaying in time with the rippling beat of the accompanying tabla. Clearly, the alien was stoned. We have to let the dough ripen, instructed Dedir. It'll take a couple of hours. How are you feeling? Rather like transitioning through the light speed threshold was the slowly spoken reply. The creature's eyes were definitely affected now. Their facets seemed to be swiveling independently, as if each was on a separate gimbal. This had the effect of shifting the reflected light through the spectrum from red to violet and back again, so that the gradients of the hue traversed the surface in undulating waves. Truly a fascinating effect, not lost on Dedir. He too was well under the influence of cannabis combined with the sinuous strains of the sitar wafting from the speaker. Yeah, man, he murmured. We're getting out there, all right. This exorbitant, began Herb, and his voice trailed off in a pause so long as to indicate he had gotten lost in the wilderness of ineffability. Yeah, it is, agreed Dedia. There followed an interval during which neither man nor bug spoke as both hung onto the edge of the astral plane, digging the overall righteous vibe that gripped the kitchen in a timeless flow of groove energy. Eventually, Ravi Shankar wrapped up his immensely long morning raga, and Alexa fell silent once more. Dedia roused himself and opened the fridge to check his block of bakeables. Solid. We're ready to bake, Herb he announced, turning on the oven to 375 degrees. We are baked, chirped the alien, chittering to itself with a sound that could only be giggling as defined on another planet. Dedia snorted in agreement and tore off three more sheets of cling film, laying them flat on the counter. He then unwrapped the block of dough and, taking a large knife, guillotined three parallel cuts, creating four equal cuboids, eight inches long and about two inches square. With his palms, he flat-rolled each of these out into a cylinder, re-wrapping them individually in the cling film sheets. Finally, he placed them in the freezer to re-harden while the oven temperature rose to the indicated level, another ten minutes or so. During this time, he prepared a couple of large cookie sheets, lining them with parchment paper. He set out his wooden cutting tray as the oven reached operating temp. He transferred the dough cylinders from the freezer back to the fridge, save for one, which he unwrapped and placed on the cutting tray. Taking a paring knife, he sliced coins about a third of an inch thick off the cylinder, counting as he sliced. The cylinder yielded about 24 coins. These he arranged on the parchment paper and slid the first cookie sheet into the oven, setting the timer for 10 minutes. Herb watched all this without speaking a word. He was, in fact, recording the whole performance by means of a biotech-enhanced sensory augmentation implant, the like of which will not be known on this planet for centuries to come. Hardwired into his brain, it operated autonomously in the same way as his translator. Daddy repeated the slicing and so forth with a second batch, taking no more than four minutes before sliding the sheet onto the oven rack beneath the first. He set a second timer for ten minutes and got out a pair of mesh cooking racks and a spatula. As he waited for the first timer to go off, he turned his attention to Herb. He drew in a deep sniff, smiled, and lifted his eyebrows. Don't that smell fine, my bug? He invited with an easy sort of charm. The aroma of baking can of butter cookies set him into a right companionable frame of mind. He might have thrown an arm over the alien's shoulders if the alien had any shoulders. Very delectable, replied Herb. His translator perhaps slightly confused, yet correct nonetheless. After taking a glance at the oven timer, Dedier offhandedly inquired, oh, What brings you here in particular, Herb? There followed a sound that was even more unworldly than the alien's name had been. Imagine the collision of a railroad tank car full of molten wax with forty naked polar bears inside of a glass factory. Dedier stared at the alien. The alien stared back. Each seemed to be expecting a clarification. Dedier scratched his chin. Herb drew a chitinous spike through its lipless mouth. The oven timer snarled. Ah! Both life forms ejaculated, eyes swiveling away from each other towards the oven. Dedier was once again all business, dragging out the first cookie sheet using a pair of potholders. 
He set this on the counter and fanned the potholders violently above the cookies to cool them a bit, waiting perhaps two minutes before using the spatula to transfer them to the cooling rack. Just as he finished clearing the first batch and setting the sheet aside, a second timer went off. He repeated the process with such precision as to indicate that he had done this many times before. Herb watched every move, as a cat might watch a goldfish in a bowl. As Dedia set about repeating the slicing and arranging of the third and fourth batches, he pointed out little details relating to the success of his methodology, tricks and shortcuts he'd accumulated over dozens of reps. When I first started baking, it took me nearly all day to do what you just saw me do in less than half that time. So, time economy is important? Herb asked. Not so much. Usually I plan ahead so I never rushed. It just satisfies me to refine any routine. Let's try one of this new batch. They're cool enough now. Stuffing one whole cookie into his mouth, Daddy held another one out to Herb. With no little gusto, that worthy collected it and crammed it into his featureless slot of a mouth. A crunch and a gulp followed. The creature's eyes were soon doing that weird, facet-shifting thing as before, to the accompaniment of Donovan, groaning out Season of the Witch. Orbiting 22,200 miles overhead, an invisible space cruiser glided silently. In the ship's control suite, the mission executor had reached the end of its allotted loitering interval. The long overdue report from the operative on Earth must now be considered unrecoverable, for reasons unknown. The rigid hierarchy of the Xenoinsectoids demanded implementation of Plan B. No alternatives were considered. The ship left orbit. The facets of Herb's eyes had shifted so far into another reflective frequency as to have become invisible to dead ear. Not transparent, just not visible. An optical experience so subjective as to be indescribable in objective terms, you had to be there. Have a cookie. Herb's eyes blinked and shifted to a burnt orange hue with acid green highlights. Wow, ma'am. The alien murmured. My team has just bugged out, so to speak. Dedia's pleasantly cruising thoughts swerved into a ditch. His own eyes focused, sort of. The alien's limbs were weaving almost hypnotically, as if pulling taffy or playing an invisible concertina. He seemed agitated, but was operating in slow motion. Ah? Daddy aroused himself to reply or inquire. My team, they have abandoned the mission and returned to the colony's hive planet. So, you're like, stranded here? Yes, but they will be back. That is the approved contingency plan. After 12,000 revolutions of your planet around its sun, they will return. Daddy was having trouble making sense of this development. Each question occurring to him seemed too ridiculous to entertain. After working through a few of these without success, he concluded the key issue was that he had been trying to apply human reasoning to alien activities. Of course, it couldn't make sense. The natural thing to do under the circumstances would be... Alexa, play 2,000 light years from home by the Rolling Stones. 2,000 light years from home by the Rolling Stones on Amazon Music. This has been The Cinemania Society Presents Bake Day. Written by Patrick Ireland. Copyright 2024. Used under permission of the author. Performed by Andy Slack. Mixing, mastering, and sound design by Ethan Ireland. Music by Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Incidental music and sound effects courtesy of Epidemic Sound. The Cinemania Society Presents is a product of the Cinemania Society, LLC.